Hello everybody and welcome to the second Rural East Suffolk podcast with me, Edward. So here we are in, uh, well, within the week before Christmas and we obviously know it's going to be a different Christmas this year, what with everything that's been going on. These are difficult times for us, of course, but I don't want to dwell on that too much because obviously we've been dwelling on that quite a lot over the past uh, few days. So uh, let's forget all about that this evening and just concentrate on what I've got for you today. And what I've got for you today, um, I want to talk a little bit about the East Anglian magazine, which a lot of you will have heard of. I've seen some um, great photographs uh, which were taken from the East Anglian magazine going back all from the 1930s to the 1980s. And although the magazine ceased publishing, I think it was about 35 years ago, um, the, the, uh, its legacy still remains very strong. Those who are interested in the uh, history and the culture of our county. Now, in um, January 2021, it will be uh, three years since I formed uh, the Rural East Suffolk in Old Photographs group. And when I first started the group, it was very much I wanted, I think I said in an early post, I said I very want, much wanted to capture the spirit of the old East Anglian magazine, of some of the people um, who wrote for it, people like George Arnott, who's very well known um, around Woodbridge, wrote the wonderful book about the River Deben. And there are many others as well. So um, I remember about six years ago, I went to, um, it's one of the first times I went, um, went to the auction house in Campsie Ash, Clark and Simpson Auction House. And it was one of the first times that I'd gone there. And I managed to pick up a whole box of East Anglian magazines very cheaply. And they dated from the 1950s to the 1970s. So when I got home and I started to look through them, I found a wonderful wealth of information. I think one of the great things about the East Anglian magazine, if it go especially in the 1950s, is that it was very interested in first-hand accounts of old people from the villagers. So you had people in their 80s who would have been born in the 1870s, uh, 1860s, 1870s, and they were uh, giving their oral testimony to the writers, and they were talking about what they remembered of their Victorian childhood. So from a point of view of social history of this uh, county, it really is crucial because those people are all now long gone. And this was the only time that their stories were told. And had these stories not been told, those wonderful, eccentric people who predominated in a lot of our Suffolk villages would have been completely forgotten about. But it's thanks to the East Anglian magazine that we can still read about those people today. And for today's podcast, what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, read for you an extract um, from an article of the East Anglian magazine from October 1951. And it is by a lady written by a lady called Gwyneth Dyke. And she seems to have lived in Butley and spent the majority of her childhood in the Suffolk Sandlings around Hoseley and Sudbourne and that way. And what I like about this story is she's um, she writes about her childhood, which lo looks like in the early 20th century, uh, growing up in the early 20th century. And she writes about some stories that some older people in the village told her when she was a little girl. So the wonderful thing about this is you have stories, um, an, an oral history in a way which goes back to the mid-19th century and all the way back to the time of the smugglers, who, as we know, were rather numerous um, along that part of the coast of Suffolk, during the early 19th century and indeed the 18th century, a little before that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read this article for you. I'm sure you'll agree it's a fascinating story, one that has never been told anywhere else. So the title of the article is called That Dear, Dear Lady and Her Tales of Long Ago by Gwyneth Dyke. 
And uh, so off we go. The village where I spent my childhood lies on the border of that deserted region along the Suffolk coast. I remember with fascination the stories the old people used to tell. I remember particularly one old lady, well over 80, whom I was fortunate to visit regularly over a period of years, and as I grew older, it was my delight to see through her eyes and the vision of the past take shape and grow and populate. Her very appearance was conducive to traditional tales, for she was more closely resembled the white witch of legend than anyone else I ever saw. She was tiny and bent double, active and strong, and she dug her garden and cleaned her house with a surprising vigour which seemed to grow with the years. Her face was deep-lined and pitted, and from above her withered rosy cheeks peered two shrewd, intelligent, beady eyes set in deep hollows of mashed and entwined wrinkles. Her mouth was small and shrunken, and her hooked nose and chin almost met. It was a lively, gallant, interesting face under the wide black hat, natural gaiety struggling with inculated piety, a face which suffered no delusions about the world, but still challenged it with enjoyment and strength. Often since then, examining the brasses of her 17th century counterparts with wide hats and shrewd Puritan independent faces, surrounded by bands of linen about the neck, bodies decorously aproned and girdled, I have been struck with the exactitude of the likeness, and almost seen, as I once saw, the worn hands plucking and smoothing the apron, as the old voice told tales of the old Suffolk, always in the background of her mind. Those stories, with the condiment of a rich dialect to add to their savour, they combined the joy of legend with the certainty of truth, for no imagination could have reproduced so faithfully the oddities and touches of human nature. Through her parents, she could feel back to the first years of the 19th century, when the Martello Towers were building and talk was all of Bonaparte and smuggled runs. My old lady's mother had lived in a lonely cottage on the wild heaths outside Butley, near the famed Hatchley Barn, now surrounded by acres of sombre pine and fir, but then free and open as the sky. She, child about 1810, I should imagine, had been able to recall the jingling of harness and the tramp of feet, muffled commands and dragging sounds in the dead of the winter night 150 years ago, and her parents, in their turn, had known the infamous Luff and Will Lord and poor Margaret, and were related to the horse seat thief, John Cook, who betrayed Margaret. Once this little girl, the mother of my old lady, had wakened and cried at the sounds below, and the smugglers, to quieten her, had bought her a tiny wooden barrel, polished and shiny, which they had bribed her not to tell of her nightly alarms. This barrel had an honoured place on the chiffonier, and as the inheritor of all these stories talked, I could watch the flames leap and die in its brilliant surface. Her father's family, at that same period, kept the greyhound at Petterstree, the old timbered inn looking over the churchyard yews and the level fields. He, as a young boy, could remember being dragged, sleeping and protesting from the bed he shared with his brothers and sisters at the dead hour of a summer night, to run fast to Wickham across the fields and rouse the grocer for beer and cheese to feed a cavalry troop on its way from Yarmouth to London after the Battle of Waterloo. The officers slept in his bed and the troopers and horses were bedded on thick straw in the deep lane between the inn and the turnpike road. Over a hundred years later, his youngest daughter could still evoke the stamp and clink of the harness in the silent dawn through which they vanished on the London road. The London road was a fascination to the big, handsome boy in his teens, and once he ran away from the farm to ride the leading horse of the stagecoach and six all the way to London. Three weeks he was gone, his then widowed mother weeping for his loss and the younger children wide-eyed and sad at his disappearance. Then with the next Yarmouth coach he rode back to tell of London in its marvels, but never more to stir foot out of East Anglia again until his dying day. As one of the farms where he worked as a semi-skilled labourer, training gradually to become horseman, 
he met and fell in love with the smuggler's black-eyed grandchild from Butley, and after their marriage they were promoted to keep the lodge at Loudon Hall. All my old lady's early memories centred on the low-storied, gloomy cottage at the edge of a plantation surrounded by rhododendrons, wet and dank in winter, deeply shaded in the hot summers of eighty years ago, as the youngest child, at home long after the others were out to service or farm work, she would run to open the gates and curtsy as the carriages passed, and once a lady visitor, taking a fancy to the little girl, gave her a bottle of wonderful scent. Tragedy ended the tale, or rather tragic comedy, for one washing day, when steam hung heavy in the kitchen, she tried to reach it from the shelf over the sink and it overbalanced, the contents falling into the water, turning it deep rosy pink like magic, and so liberally scenting the shirts and smocks that for the next fortnight father got a rare leg pulling in the stocks yard, him going round pale pink and smelly. Then came service in one of the tall houses by Melton Hill and later on in one of the big mansions surrounded by a well-kept park. But she soon left to marry and rear her own family in the tiny cottage where I knew her. Hers was a busy, active life. Chapel and its weekday meetings and services, treats and burials, the children, the mending, the washing, the brewing, the baking, the gardens, and later still, the nephews and grandchildren coming home from the Boer War or the Great War. Picture postcards of queerly named places. The folding cap of a gentleman in khaki, the framed velvet embossed views of Cape Town and the Veldt, Brussels and Cologne. Now in my time all were scattered and gone. None was left to be spanked or shivvied but the big Timmy, who, true to tradition, sat upon the three-legged stool waving his striped tail and washing his striped ears, as I used to sit and watch the sun sink below the geraniums in the window and the bees grow less busy in the lavender. The visions grew and grew to be shattered by her vehement change of tone, as the delinquencies of the village boys or a turbulent disagreement over right of way with the aggressive next-door neighbour came into her thoughts and the Victorian peace faded. That peace was to suffer more than from those great depredations, for during the Second Great War there came two small scared boys, evacuees, who were quite convinced that she was a witch. Currently cake and Sunday school, a Saturday walk to my daughters, and a daily ruthless cleansing, combing and scrubbing soon dispelled their fears. And at night, all unknowing, they were put into the same bed from which once a boy was turned to make room for the veterans of Waterloo. The next-door neighbours' inquiries were lost in those of Hitler, whose old aeroplanes dropped their bums and shook the plaster off the ceiling. It was with regret that later, away from the village, in the Russian role of approaching D-Day, I heard of the death of my old lady, a regret deepened by the consideration that I had never heard more of her unique stories, or recorded them sooner, and mingled with gratitude to the friend who opened my eyes to the bygone Suffolk I never knew. And there we have it. What a quite um, wonderful tale. And I would just like to reflect um, briefly on those final words. Um, a regret deepened by the consideration that I had never heard more of her unique stories or recorded them sooner, and mingled with gratitude to the friend who opened my eyes to the bygone Suffolk I never knew. Well, thanks to that article... And um, Gwyneth Dyke, who wrote down the stories, we now um, can cherish that legacy too. And we can now hear these stories, which would otherwise um, have been lost by the dear old lady, who obviously had a... And it always interests me reading these stories, that some of these older people um, who who grew up in the Victorian times would never have gone far from the place they were born. This uh, old lady, it would seem she never really strayed much further than Pettistry or Melton. And yet she had a wealth of stories to tell and she had a wealth of life experience. And it just goes to show, doesn't it, that you don't need to travel to the furthest flung corners of the world in order to get experience of life. You can stay right at home and you can still have a very rich um, and fulfilling life. Well, I greatly enjoyed that story. I hope you enjoyed it too. And what I like too is I love the style of writing of it. I love the way the lady writes and the um, some of the phrases that she uses. 
Let's see here, natural gaiety, struggling with inculated piety, a face which suffered no delusions about the world but still challenged it with enjoyment and strength. There's something very lyrical and poetical in the writings there. So um, I know we've got quite a few members um, and listeners who come from the Wicker Market or Sandlings area. I wonder if any of you knew Gwyneth Dyke, um, the author of the article. I'm not sure. I think she might have been a rather regular com contributor. She, so I will um, try and dig through my collection, see if we have any more articles by her. Um, and who knows, she may, she may have some more stories to tell, but I'm sure we can be very grateful to her for sharing her memories of the older people from that village where she spent her own childhood. And I mean to think that today we can still have an oral history of, obviously not a first-hand oral history, but there is still an oral history passed down through the generations which can remember all the way back to the Battle of Waterloo and beyond. So, um, as regards to the comments, I wonder if any of you have any similar old stories which was um, which were passed down orally through your families, which can go back a um, hundred or so years. If you do, I'm sure we'd all love to hear about them. I remember a couple of years ago, and I'm now uh, it's around Christmas, this is appropriate, my grandmother always used to tell me that she was served cold rabbit pie every Christmas morning when she was a young girl. So I mentioned this on the group, and there were quite a few others who said, yes, I well remember being served cold rabbit pie on a Christmas morning. And there were a few others who said, well, I'm actually going to be having some cold rabbit pie this Christmas morning, and I've never... Uh, left the tradition behind. So I was obviously very pleased to hear that the tradition does still um, prevail in some households on Christmas morning. So anyway, well, I've rambled on for about uh, 17, 18 minutes. So I think that's just about enough from me. And it just leaves me to say, I hope you all have um, a good Christmas. I know we've all been dealt a rather cruel blow in the last 24 hours. And certainly there's going to be a lot of us who are going to be rather downhearted at having to change our plans at such short notice and perhaps not being able to enjoy the sort of Christmas we usually would. So what I'd like to do um, to close is just read you a poem by Thomas Tusser, who was a farmer from Brantham in the 1550s, all the way back in the um, 16th century. Um, he wrote the Standard Agricultural Textbook which was in use until at least the 16th century. And in this poem, he encouraged his fellow farmers to remember the labourers and the poor at Christmas. So here we go. <clears throat> the poor. At Christmas, good husbands have corn on the ground, in barn and in solar worth many a pound, with plenty of other things, cattle and sheep, and sent them, no doubt, on good houses to keep. At Christmas the hardness of winter doth rage, a griper of all things, and especially age. Then lightly, poor people, the young with the old, be sorest oppressed with hunger and cold. At Christmas by labour is little to get, that wanting the poorest in danger are set. What season then better, of all the whole year, thy needy poor neighbour to comfort and cheer? At this time and that time, some make a great matter, some help not but hinder the poor with their clatter. Take custom from feasting, what cometh then last, where one hath a dinner, a hundred shall fast. Good husband and huswife, now chiefly be glad, things handsome to have as they ought to be had. They both do provide against Christmas to come, to welcome good neighbour, good cheer to have some. Good bread and good drink, a good fire in the hall, brawn, pudding and souse, and good mustard withal. Beef, mutton and pork, shred pies of the best, pig, veal, goose and capon, and turket well dressed. Cheese, apples and nuts, jolly carols to hear, and then in the country is counted good cheer. What cost to good husband is any of this good household provision only it is? Of other the like I do leave out a many, that costeth the husbandman never a penny. At Christmas be merry, and thankful withal, and feast thy poor neighbour the great with the small, yea, all the year long to the poor let us give, 
God's blessing to follow us while we do live. That was Thomas Tusser, 500 pound, five, from 500 points of husbandry um, from 1571. So I am going to close off now um, by once again saying thank you very much for listening to this podcast. I hopefully um, will be able to do another one next week. But in the meantime, I wish you all, wherever you may be and however you may be spending it, um, very many happy returns uh, for Christmas and for the new year ahead. Goodbye.